Working It Out, a podcast show about diversity, equity, and inclusion in our workplaces, our communities, and our lives. A show where we put diversity and inclusion to work. Got problems on the job. We're working it out. With that workplace got you stressing. We're working it out. With that yeah, we're working it out. Working it out. Working it out. Welcome. I'm Dr. Vanessa Weaver, your host of Working It Out. On this episode, I'm joined by Sonia Aline, a multifaceted communications and marketing professional. Sonia has recently authored a bestseller, I Kick Ass at Work, the strategy journal for career professionals. It's the first journal of its kind, and it was developed to help women gain better insight and perspective about how they perform at their jobs, and to also help them better detail their accomplishments at work as they happen. And you know, that's really important because we do so much, we often forget the contributions we've made. Sonia also has a career as an editor who has interviewed top business talent, including Ursula Burns, Oprah Winfrey, Don Thompson, who was a former CEO of McDonald's and Canadian billionaire, Michael Lee Chin. She's also organized incredible business conferences Today, we're here to discuss her book and to hear her share the secrets to career success. Welcome, Sonia. Thank you so much, Dr. Weaver. Thank you. Well, thank you. We're so excited to talk to you because we, too, at Alignment Strategies, have developed courses and models focused on women's career success, and it's going to be very interesting to see how our work intersects. So again, welcome so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, Sonia... I am intrigued by the title of your book. <laughs> Tell me a little bit about why you decided to name your book. Um, it's an interesting story. I was sitting in a job that I was dissatisfied with, and but I was beating myself up. And mm-hmm. so one of the days during my lunch hour, I decided to write down all of the things that I had done. When I interview uh, either uh, people who are going to be interns or folks who are going to work with me, I was asked them, like, what story do you want to tell when you leave this job? And so I was frustrated with myself because I felt like I didn't have a story, that I'd worked really hard, but I didn't have a story to tell. And when I decided to write everything down, um, two and a half pages later, everything that I had done at the job, I literally said to myself, I kick ass at work. Like I really do. So in one moment I was beating myself up because I didn't feel accomplished. And in the next sense, I felt this this great sense of pride and accomplishment because I did create something. And so I wanted it to be a, a provocative title because the work is can be that intense that I wanted people to, to, to really feel a sense of, of ownership when they decided to look at what they did and recognize how much of a contributor um, they are in the workplace. So it was revolutionary for me in that moment to say, and I could see how my energy changed, how, how, how the, the confidence from me beating myself up, the, there was a confidence shift. And I thought it would be important to create a tool that encouraged other women to do the same thing. That's an amazing story. Thank you so much for sharing that. Because how many times do we beat ourselves up, particularly when we're at a job that we don't you know, particularly like or feel that people are not really acknowledging our contribution. So thank you so much for sharing it with us. Well, you know, it's interesting because you talked about being at a job that you were you know, not feeling that great about. And we know that for the last year, 47 million people, many of them women left the workforce, just left their jobs, left the workforce and said, whatever they said, they poof, they disappeared. And we know a lot of it might be due to the the COVID pandemic, but also we know that as a result of that, today's workforce looks more different than ever before. So when you think about these 47 million people, many of of whom are women, how does this, your book, your career model, help them reconsider how they wanna re-enter the workforce or reposition themselves in the jobs that they have? Right. So that number actually gets me excited because I feel that there are more of us awake than folks who are just content with how things are going, whether we like them or not. And Mm -hmm. so 
what was important about the pandemic was because it was such a surprise, because it was so disruptive, it forced us to re-examine how we were living our lives. And so to watch so many people perish around us, to watch so many people get sick, possibly to the to, to the to the point of death, yeah. I think really shook a lot of people up to say, what am, what am I really doing? What why am I doing this? And so what I would hope is that this book or even just to encourage people, whether you buy my book or not, the importance to journal and to really look at where you are, look at where you want to go and take the necessary steps to do that. You know, this book is really about all the things that you personally can do to change your career. We often blame everything on they, right? So when you think about a lot of the discussions around workforce development and career development, we hear a lot of complaints. It's what they are doing. It's what they won't let me do. It's 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 where they've kept me. And, and I want to be really clear that I understand that all the isms exist, all of them, racism, sexism, ageism, the discrimination around or um, sexual orientation. They are real because they're the fabric of the society that we live in. So if we know that, now what are we going to do? What do we want to take responsibility for? What do I as a professional want to take responsibility for? And there's a lot that we don't, that we just kind of um, give up to the system or give up to our coworkers or give up to our bosses. And so this is a tool to really look at what you are responsible for and what you can do to make a difference in your own career. Well, you know, I, I, you make, I have two questions I want to ask you just based on what you just shared. Mm-hmm. Is that not thinking about and being clear about the you and all of that? Is that a unique uh, situation for women? That's my first question. I think it is a unique situation for women because what we, um, and I think it's a unique situation for workers in general. So we always think about, like I've heard people say, I don't really want to ask for a raise because I know the company is doing poorly, right? Or I don't know if this is a good time because of what's going on in the company for me to do something else. And we've all kind of either been in that situation, seen that situation. And then you see the company either hire somebody else and pay them more than they were paying you or bring in a whole new division or discard a division because the company is always going to take care of its needs. And so what I'm saying is, although we understand the purpose of work is for you to to carry out an instruction or direction that you were given that you were hired for, you also have to be able to see yourself in that in that as well. And so how are you developing in, in as much as you're giving, how are you developing as an individual? How are you developing as a professional? And is this on path for what I want to do later on in life? Is this, is this on path? Is this going to take me on the direction that I want to do to fulfill my personal dreams and goals? So I do think that it's it's new for. Um, for people in general, I do. You know, for the women's part of it, I think you're so on target because a lot of times we as women just don't take the time or don't feel like we don't have the time to do that kind of introspection. Exactly. You know, we're so busy taking care of either kids or the multiple roles on our jobs or our partners, I mean, or just giving, giving, giving that yeah. we don't really provide the time or take the time to get to ourselves. I really appreciate that differentiation that you you just shared. So this is my second question. Your book is different because it really encourages, in fact, requires uh, women, I guess the men could take the book too, to journal. So what is it about journaling that makes uh, makes it an effective technique around thinking about the brand or your career? Right. So a lot of my my spiritual beliefs, um, I, I, I poured into this as well. And so I believe the, the process of writing is very cathartic and it's very revealing. And so this is your, your time to write honestly about not just the challenges that you're having in, at work, but the things that are inspiring you, the the um, the things that you've accomplished, like all of the good things as well. It gets you a chance to put these things down in a safe place. And the whole purpose of being able to write these things down is so that you can go back now and reflect and review 
and look at what needs to be changed. So now you can look at patterns in behavior because we're so, you know, many of us are conditioned by um, by our parents, by our religious communities, by our relationships. And sometimes a lot of our actions are just automatic, right? We don't really think them through. And so this gives you a chance to look at what you've done and then see what patterns are in it. And if they're good patterns, then those are patterns that you want to keep and enhance. But if they're negative patterns or distracting patterns, and this is a chance for you to look at them and say, you know what, I I need to look at this differently. Okay. And and it it creates a safe space too, doesn't it? It creates a a very safe space because what I believe too, is that your thoughts are also actions, Mm -hmm. right? So not just what you do physically, but your emotions and your thoughts are also actions because your emotions and your thoughts are what it's going to trigger you to behave in a certain way. So even though you might not say certain things out loud, or you might be thinking some things or feeling some things, this is a place to put all of that down, right? Like so-and-so, um, you know, every time she shows up for a project, um, she irritates me, right? Or I felt passed over for an interview or, or a, a promotion again, right? So this is a chance to understand like, why do I feel passed over? You know, mm-hmm. why does this person irritate me? Why am I jealous? Why am I angry? These aren't bad emotions, but they're, they're, they give you an opportunity when you outline them and look at them, they give you an opportunity to reflect on why am I feeling like this? And what can I do to change my feelings, my thoughts, so I, now I can change my outcome? Well, Sonia, that was so helpful. And let me ask you, th- and let me ask you this, because in your book, you talk about the four R's, which are record, re- review, reflect, and resolve, right? So how do those four R's tie into what you just said? You so know, the, the first importance of journaling. Right. So the very first thing is to record. That's the act, right? And so I think that's an important act because now you're telling um, yourself, the universe, like, I'm, I'm, I want to look at this. I want to, to, to document what's actually going on because then I want to keep a record of this to help me understand what's going on next. Um, the reviewing is just that it's important now after you've recorded some things to look and see like, oh, this is, I noticed that I do this often. I notice that I think about this often. I know that I feel this way every time this situation comes up and then you have to reflect on that. So, which is asking yourself the questions, like, why do I feel this way, right? Why am I always feeling like I'm underpaid and undertitled? Like, why does that happen in every situation that, that, I, that I go to? And then the last part of that is the resolution, because we don't want to just get stuck with these emotions, right? You want to be able to solve them so that you can move to the next level. And so the resolution part is really important. And you may not do that right away. Resolution might come after you're flipping through your journal and you see what you've done. And then you can be like, oh, no, I've I've solved this problem. I don't feel like this anymore. I've released that issue. Um, And so resolution is important because it gives you a sense of accomplishment. And so it's it's a four step program, a four step system that's that's really simple. But the goal is to get you to to record, and then to solve whatever you're you're looking at or whatever you're facing. So in many respects, it teaches you how to be, or teaches a woman how to be her own therapist. Yes. Yeah. Because, be accountable. Yeah. You know, I'm a clinical psychologist from, by training. And as I listen to you talk about record, review, reflect, resolve, you know, those are steps that, those are part of the therapeutic process that you often take, that I've often taken my clients through. So this is great that you're teaching people to kind of self, uh, self treat themselves. I think that's awesome. Right. So or what- to recognize, I think that's important that you say that, or even to recognize through this process that I may need help, right? Yeah. That I may need to get either a coach or I may need to see a therapist. Yeah. So when you see all these things, then you can, I think you can be helpful even in when you go see someone that you can say, look, this is, I know this is what I'm struggling with. This is the pattern that I'm mm-hmm. seeing. Mm-hmm. So I think that that's also important, which I yeah. didn't realize until just now. So thank you for that. So thank <laughs> yeah, you. I was, I was so excited listening to you with those four, with those four R's. So what has been a response to your book? It's been great so far. So unexpected, I've had, um, anecdotally, I've had a couple of people, at least three people say that they've gotten promotions um, from doing this process. I've also have a a good friend of mine who says now that her reviews are seamless 
because she's clear about what she wants to go in and, and talk about during her review. Um, and so that she and her supervisor have this great connection now or this great exchange um, when it's review time, because she's written everything down. She's clear about what she is doing, what she's not doing. And so she can have a very um, substantive uh, discussion with her supervisor. Oh, that's awesome. That is so awesome. What a, what a gift. What a gift you're providing. So let me ask you this question, because there's a lot of times there's a debate about the intergenerations uh, in the workplace, Gen Z versus, you know, Gen Y versus Gen X. And do you see a difference between how baby boomers have dealt with their career versus the way Gen Z's, many of them entry-level professionals, are dealing with their career? Is, is uh, yeah, I think that um, Gen Z and younger professionals are clear about, you know, I thought about this question earlier, and I was going to say right and wrong, but it's not right and wrong. They're really clear about what works for them and what doesn't work for them. Mm -hmm. They're really clear about that. So whether it's right or wrong, um, or whether it's, I um, uh, forget the term that's often used um, with them, but they, they, they do have a really good sense of this works for me and this doesn't work for me. Mm -hmm. And I think our generation was just about getting the work done, right? You didn't, you couldn't, you weren't really weren't supposed to complain. It was supposed to be hard. It was supposed to be tough and you were just supposed to work through Cover it. And through so there it, wasn't yeah. a lot of discussion. There wasn't a lot of reflection. It was just get it done. And so I think that there could be a really good, I think they're things that Gen Z can learn from baby boomers. Um, and I, I don't think it's their fault. I think it's the society that everything is instantaneous. Like, you know, even, you know, when you think about when you had to do a term paper, right? Mm -hmm. The hours you had to spend in a library and the coins you had to find to put into the copy machine and the, you know, technology has made so many things um, that much easier. And so instant, they expect things to be instantaneous. Um, and so I think that there, there can be, a, I think we can learn from one another um, in a really positive way. But I, what I what I take from them is that they're, how clear the clarity they have around what works for them and what, do, if they're uncomfortable in a situation, they're going to remove themselves. They don't believe in being punished or sitting in punishment um, just for a paycheck, right? Like that's the attitude, just for a paycheck. If this isn't, you know, I have a nephew and, you um, you know, he's actually, they've created like this little network, he and his friends and, and new people where they discuss like, you know, how they can manage their work situation and how they can overcome certain challenges. So they are really resourceful in terms of trying to figure out like how to make things better and more comfortable for themselves. And I, I actually respect that a lot. Yeah, I tell you, just even in the recent, uh, in the midterm elections, it it really, I think, brought uh, to, um, to attention the power that our Gen Zs and our Gen Xs and our Gen Ys are bringing to our whole life experience. So Absolutely. thank you for sharing that. So, you know, when we started, you shared the story about why you, uh, why you wrote this book. And in your career as an editor, you've interviewed people like Ursula Burns, who was a Black female CEO of Xerox, and of course, Oprah Winfrey. When you think about those interviews, what what was one of your main main takeaways about how they managed or thought about their careers? Oh, so what I loved about um, Ursula is that she was really clear about where she came from didn't define who she was. Say more and about that. that. Important for um, everyone. So she grew up very poor. Mm -hmm. um, she, daughter of a single mom, mm -hmm. but she said her mom always told them that where they came from could never define who they were. What and um, obviously she took that to heart um, because she was able to become, you know, the, the first African-American woman to head a fortune 500 company and has gone on to do, continue to do amazing uh, things. And in um, fact, wasn't she, didn't she start off as a secretary? She started off as an executive assistant. She did. Okay. And so um, I believe that's how she started off. She did actually work as a, um, an assistant to the president as well. You have to double, double check that. But okay. she literally did work her way up 
through um, the organization. She ended up marrying her, um, her husband died recently. Um, her husband was her mentor as well. And he was the one who got her to see beyond the technical work because she worked as an engineer. So mm -hmm. he was the one who helped her see beyond just working technically and to, to, to see the organization as a whole, which was a huge help to her um, as she became the leader of the organization, obviously. She's, um, she was she is phenomenal. Not that she was phenomenal. She yes. still is phenomenal. And what about, and what about Oprah Winfrey? Um, there were two takeaways, two takeaways that I had gotten um, for her that, that have affected me for a long time. Um, the first one was, um, she said, you always know. And it's, it's a very simple piece of advice, but she says, no matter what you're doing, you always know. And it's important for you to listen to that inner piece of you. And she shared that the second piece of that, or the second part of that was she had shared that decisions that she had made with her ego were the ones that had always gotten her in trouble. But the decisions that she had made based on an internal knowing or from spirit were the ones that ended up being successful. So the example she uses was the um, signing on to work with oxygen. And so she said the reason that she decided to do the Oxygen Network was because people kept coming to her and saying, uh, you're the queen of talk. How are you going to let another network come and, and create a, a network that's going to talk to women? That's you. You're the queen. You're this. Mm -hmm. um, and she said even when she signed the contract on that final day, she had turned to her attorney and said, am I doing the right thing? And she said, when you have to ask that question, uh, she said, it's usually because you know that there's something not right about what you're doing and you're you're waiting for the validation to come in. So um, again, concisely, it's you always know. And, and that's part of the message in this book is that you know what's right for you. You know when a situation doesn't feel um, comfortable or when things are are feeling uncomfortable or 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 dissatisfying. And um and what's important is that you that you um, summon the courage to be able to make the change that's necessary for you to, to, to be happy and to be on this journey that you were here to do. Oh, wow. That was a real gift. You always know. Because when you were, when you were sharing that with us, Sonia, I thought, how many times did I hear that little voice say, Vanessa, this doesn't feel right. It does. Oh, Vanessa, mm, don't do that. But Vanessa went on and did it because sometimes you feel like, well, if it doesn't turn out right, I'm I'm big enough, bad enough, strong enough to correct it. Exactly. And find that, uh, you know, when Oprah talked about it, it was her ego that often led to to some of those bad decisions. I can really, I can resonate to those. You know, I could. I think I we all. Completely. Yeah. You know, in all the years that I've interviewed people, I've never heard anyone say, you know, I followed my intuition and boy, was that wrong. <laughs> like yeah. everyone who has been on a successful journey has talked about how much their intuition, how much their gut, how much their um, innards told them this mm -hmm. is what to do, or this is what not to do. And of course, we have the free choice to play out whatever scenario we want. But in the end, we always know, to your point, that, um, yeah, we knew that this was a road that we probably wouldn't have gone down. Yeah. Well, uh, we have a lot of companies and organizations that tune into our show. And given that we lost 47 million people in the workforce in the last year, yeah. and almost 2 million women uh, have not come back, that left, you know, uh, during COVID have not returned. What would you say to companies to do to keep their women as top talent? You know, from some of the reports that I've seen is it's the same, the, the, the same reasons, the same things that people complain about over and over and over again. And I think that some companies are working better to make sure that they can um, make these changes, but it's feeling that they're valued. That's a huge thing for, for people, feeling that their work matters, feeling that their voice matters, um, being compensated for the work they do. I mean, those are really like the basics and money is not even the, the, the top issue. It's really about feeling valued. And so we all know that there are companies that pay lip service to that. And there are companies that pay, um, that, that really work to create an environment that 
um, will help their employees. But my message is really to those individuals um, to find a way to make yourself valuable and for you to honor the value that you bring to an organization. And so I, I really feel like that's that's really important. So the, the, the organizations op- absolutely have an, uh, an obligation to make sure that they have strong, supportive work environments. But I really do feel that it's important for individuals to take ownership of what they can take ownership of, um, building the relationships that you need to build, um, which can help make you feel safer and secure, more secure in an environment, um, to make sure that, that you are upgrading your skills in a way that that are that match the time, right? It doesn't matter if you have 25 years experience if the if the experience is not relative to the to the time that we're living in. And that that you take time to explore and develop yourself as an individual and as a person so that you can have a well-rounded um a well-rounded experience at your company. I tell people make sure you take your vacations. Americans don't take vacations on average. Yeah. Um, and when we take, we work through. We work. We work through everything. We work through our I'm lunch. Look at that. I'm yeah, so it, 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 it that. is kind of you know it's the American culture. I mean, how many times have you traveled somewhere and you met someone from Germany and they're on their you know second week of a six week stay? Yeah. Like they they've taken the whole six weeks. They, right? they take the whole month of August off. Whole month of In August. European countries, yeah, for exactly. Us. And so. You know, what I've also, you know, through a lot of my research as well as I found that that people are most creative and most expressive in terms of creating um, good places for themselves when they detach from 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 the treadmill, from the hamster's wheel. And so all of those things are are important. So, yes, to I mean, to answer your question, yes, there's there's an obligation for the organization. um, But I really with the women that I mentor um, the organization, organizations that I speak to, I really impress upon individuals to take as much responsibility to increase their value and to honor the value that they bring to an organization. Well, you know, I totally agree with that. But one of the things that I was thinking companies can do is to have is to buy your book, I Kick Ass at Work. <laughs> I love that and, idea. And then to, you know, through their ERGs or their BRGs or their women networks to really have them take the time to do those four R's, you know, which is record, review, reflect, and resolve. Can you imagine if companies said, you know, we want you to focus on this, on your brand, on what matters to you, and we're going to provide you the time and space during the workday to reflect on that. Yeah. I, you know, I I love um, that idea because what happens is we're usually just hitting deadlines after deadlines, right? we don't have time to sit and think about because there's another project waiting for us to get done. And yeah. so it, it really is, it's, it's important so that we can tap into um, all of the greatness that we have, um, that we can offer these organizations if they're willing. Well, Sonia, I wanna thank you for sharing this important information with us today. I love your stories. I love your approach to Uh, encouraging women to take the time out to think about their career. So again, on behalf of my Working It Out team, I wish my listeners and viewers a safe, productive, and what we call Be Happy Week. Goodbye. I'm your host, Dr. Vanessa Weaver. Working It Out is brought to you by Alignment Strategies, a management consultancy with more than three decades of experience in diversity, equity, and inclusion and organizational development. To learn more, visit alignmentstrategies.com. Got problems on the job. We're working it out. With that workplace got you stressing. We're working it out. With that yeah, we're working it out. Working it out. Working it out.